Thank you very much for inviting me. I really welcome the opportunity to have to, to speak today on items that uh, I, I, I want to bring to your attention. Um, let me say I will jump to kind of the end, almost to the end, but not to the end. And then I'm going to backtrack to the 1930s and move forward. And I'm not going to speak very well about the United States government. I mean, I'm sorry, but for those of you that, <laughs> OK. Uh, and, and when I say that, I don't mean everybody. Uh, I'm an employee of at least one state government, and that's the New York state government. But I mean uh, small factions inside the United States government, uh, mostly, OK? What I want to mention at the very beginning is something that's right at the bottom under seven uh, of this um, uh, outline that you all should have in front of you. If you don't have it, is there any extras around? Um, is there any extras around? Because I have, I, I prefer not to give up mine. Okay, give it to, to whoever, okay? We have a group of, uh, anybody need one? Yes, sir. Here's one. Anybody else? Everybody? Warren Buffett, as you, as some of you know who are in Buffalo, know that Warren Buffett is the owner of the Buffalo News, and it's the only newspaper Warren Buffett owns. And uh, he's actually kind of proud of it. He knows it doesn't make him any money. He just wants to keep at it. I don't know why, but that's where it's at. Okay. Warren Buffett, of course, is if not the most wealthy person in the world. He's right up there in the top five. I think it moves up and in and in and out. Okay. And uh, he's extremely well known in, in finance. And he made the comment in 2002 that I've quoted there that derivatives are a financial weapon of mass destruction. Derivatives are actually uncontrolled derivatives are a financial weapon of mass destruction. That's a serious charge, OK? If you have, if you are in control of a weapon of mass destruction, think about what you might be able to try to accomplish with a weapon of mass destruction. So that took me back to the 1930s. And I'm going to now go forward with a theme. The theme I'm going to talk about this evening is what someone has called shock therapy, shock doctrine, shock capitalism, whatever you, whichever word you prefer. But it's the, always the same concept. The concept is control a population, a country, the United States, another country, or a state like, like uh, Louisiana and New Orleans, control an, a population by shocking them and while they are being shocked, they can be controlled then better than any other time. And then you reestablish this, you, re, you establish a new agenda, and then you force them to put up with it, basically, OK? Um, now, the prelude that I want to uh, offer here is 1933, in which we did not have a shock doctrine in the, in the sense that I am going to be using it. Roosevelt comes into office in 1933 on a, as you probably mostly know, on a conservative agenda. He didn't make a lot of noise about doing lots of stuff that is known as the New Deal. Now, however, he quickly introduced items that became known as the New Deal, one of which, by the way, is the Glass-Steagall Act, which separates commercial banking from investment banking. I, I have to mention this very clearly at the beginning, because I have to come back to it at the end of this talk. He separated commercial banking from investment banking, commercial bank, and by, by law, OK? And he set up the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the defense of, of, our, of, our, of our deposits and banks through the FDIC. All that was established in 1933 under the, under the Glass-Steagall Act. You, we all took it for granted. It lasted so long, OK? What did it do? It said that somehow our deposits in commercial banks are secure. We're not going to, we're not going to, they're, they're not at risk, it seemingly. Unless the whole government falls apart, they're not at risk. Risk goes over into investment bankers, okay? That wasn't the case before. They were integrated. 
Okay, they were integrated. Separating it out was a big step forward, or however you want to look at it. It was a big step in any way. The New Deal begins with, from a laborer's point of view, with extremely important Section 7 of the National Industrial Recovery Act, which gives the workers a simple statement, you have a right to organize. You have a right to be unionized. I mean, it sounds almost trivial, okay, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't trivial in any way whatsoever because this is the first time the United States government said to you that you have a right to be unionized, that I had a right to be unionized, okay? It wasn't just I, that I would fight for it, but the government said that, that I had a right to it. It somehow almost seemed like a human right, okay? And uh, it, had major in, it had a major impact, not in the way you might expect. It had a major impact because workers really started to try and unionize. I mean, we had almost a general strike in San Francisco. We had a, a strike, a strikes throughout the southern part of the United States in the textile sector, which some say were the closest we ever came to a revolution in the United States, were those strikes in the southern part of the United States in 1934. So it had a big impact. By, I, I, I'm going to go forward and then I'm going to go back. As it turned out, those strikes were lost. They were defeated. And the Roosevelt administration didn't support the workers in these strikes. So it basically, it was what the, the words gave encouragement, but then the workers got defeated. So by the time you got to 1935, you're really basically no better off than you were in 1933, the beginning of 1933, OK? That's, so that's where we are in 1935. But something happens in 1933 that is given insufficient attention, and that is that, that certain major capitalists in the United States basically tried to organize a coup against the United States government basically tried to organize a coup against the United States government. And uh, the companies behind that were uh, Goodyear. I mean, the owners of the company that were behind it were um, Goodyear, Birdseye, Heinz, Maxwell House, General Motors, and Prescott Bush, OK? What do I mean to say that they tried to organize a coup? What I mean to say is that they actually tried to get a general named Butler, who was a hero in the First World War, had several congressional medals of honor, one of which, by the way, was in Cuba, which he himself thought he never deserved, but that's another not so important. But they tried to organize this very famous general, more, probably more famous than Eisenhower, okay, to, to, to organize a coup against Roosevelt in 1933, um, and either actually take over the government or, at le or put him under kind of house arrest where he would have to do what, what, he, what, what he was told to do, okay? Now, you think this may be kind of just, you know, there's no evidence for it or whatever. There is, there was a whole congressional committee that investigated. And that congressional committee that investigated is the predecessor of the famous house on American Activities Committee. It had a predecessor, okay, which was supposed to be looking at Nazis. I mean, it was looking at Nazis at that time, okay? The committee was. The committee from maybe, in retrospect, was not so bad at that, what, I don't know, <laughs> as it came to be known, okay? Anyway, they, the, this General Butler goes to the committee in 1934 and exposes the whole thing and basically wipes out the possibility of that coup ever happening. But it led to a full congressional investigation, and they had testimony leading up to something like 4,000 pages of, of, of evidence, OK? And pointing fingers and so forth and so on. Now, a lot of it, and what's kind of important, is a lot of it was suppressed. So we didn't know very much about it. But we, I, I, we, know where, we kind of know where it is now. I have a handout sheet that I could, for anybody who wants an elaboration, I can lead you to, the, to where uh, the elaboration. But anyway. So what you had then is an attempted shock, which would really be a shock in the United States to have a fascist coup against our government, right? An open one. Because they wanted to bring soldiers into Washington to do it. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just an election strategy. But it failed. 
And according to the evidence I understand is that one of the one of the deals that was made to people like Prescott, Prescott Bush is that you would not be prosecuted if you support the New Deal. So a deal, as I get it, I'm not 100% sure of this, but it looks like the deal was made by Roosevelt that if you, if you guys don't want to get prosecuted, you have to stand uh, behind the New Deal and not cause any more trouble. Um, the, so you get, so that's kind of sus helped sustain Roosevelt in his administration. And then you get a 1930, you, know, you get a 1935, the replacement for Section 7A of the Industri Industrial Recovery Act, which gave the right to unionize, and that's the so-called Wagner Act, which had to be put in place when the previous act was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. Then you get another wave of organizing, which I'm, is not my point to talk about today, but in specifically the General Motors uh, sit-down strikes of late 36 and, and 37, which, of course, lead the whole wave of the a strong wave of the uh, of unionization, uh, unionization through the Congress of Industrial Organization, the CIO. And in 1938, you get the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, which gives the, you know, establishes the right to uh, a minimum wage and uh, other factors, which are also very important. So you get factors important for the uh, for the uh, which we take for granted today, which came out of the New Deal, New Deal administration on the backs of a failed shock, or from our point of view, and a successful defeat of a shock, of an attempted shock, okay? I'm now, I'm, that's never gonna happen again, to this day. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna explain what, what I mean by that as I go along. So, uh, we now, I'm now moving up to, so I'm just done, finished number one here, which is the prelude, which is just because I didn't elaborate it because it took a little bit too much to elaborate it. And number two is just a, a pretty simple point. I don't want to have to say much about it, but um, Eisenhower gives his farewell address in whatever the exact month was because there was a chance, I think it was January of 1961, in which he makes a reference to the military-industrial complex. I, by the way, I think that the, sometimes we overemphasize what Eisenhower is doing because he doesn't, I mean, he, he, he's not anti-military in, in the statement. He's just saying, be cautious. You know, these guys have a lot of money and a lot of power now, and it can undermine our democracy. But it wasn't like, let's stop militarism. It wasn't like that at all, as far as, at least as I read his statement. And that is proven by the fact that actually he was supporting two military interventions as he was leaving office. One is, of course, the Bay of Pigs. And the second was when, Eisen, when, excuse me, when Kennedy gets elected, Kennedy goes in his office and they have a transition meeting a couple of days before. And uh, Kennedy asks him, you know, what do you think about Laos? And, and there's two possibilities. One is to have some cooperation with a, quote, communist in Laos and have a, a neutral government or... or smash the communists, and Eisenhower says smash the communists. I mean, go to war against the communists in Laos. Vietnam wasn't so important. It was Laos that was important and, and was being discussed in, um, in, this, in this period. Now, that's at this, within days, one, two days, one way or another, okay, of, of Eisenhower's farewell address, which is probably the most famous farewell address ever given by any president. I, 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 at least it's right up there in the top two or three, and if it's not the most famous, okay? But what Eisenhower is reflecting is the, the first of all, I think a couple of things. One is he is a, obviously a military commander who was extremely well respected as a military commander, whether deservedly or not, but it was a fact, okay? And, and that gave him the ability to say something which nobody could really, I mean, he, you had to kind of have to respect it, kind of. You know, he knew it. I mean, he knew he was, you know, he knew where he was coming from. Um, the other thing I think that's kind of important is that Eisenhower grew up in an, in an era, 19, in the 1920s and 1930s, where we didn't have a large military. So he could feel the difference. I mean, it's hard for us to feel what it is to be in a non-militarized society because we live in a society where it's so militarized that we have more military expenditures than all the other uh, countries in the world put together. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable how, how militarized the United States is now. But Eisenhower was living through a period which that, which it wasn't that like that at all. So he could kind of look and, you know. The other factor about Eisenhower that is not so favorable uh, in this respect, I don't care about anything else right now, 
is that he, when, when he made the comment, he took no responsibility for it. I mean, he did it in the last couple of days in his office, okay? So he could say whatever he wanted, it wouldn't make, didn't make any difference, okay? Uh, and, but I will say one thing on the other side of the ledger, and that is that he was thinking about it for quite a while. According to his brother, he was working on that speech for a year and a half ahead of time. So it wasn't just a, you know, a spare of the moment kind of thought that he, he, that, that he came up with. So uh, I just put those things in, somehow in the background. Now, I want to go to John F. Kennedy, because this is now where we're going to get controversial, maybe. I don't, know, where, I, don't know, I don't know my audience that well, so I don't know how controversial I'm going to get. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think, first of all, the Jack Kennedy, as I'm reading it, is kind of an accident, okay? Um, and, I, and I mean that as, as, in this case, winding up to be a very favorable accident uh, for us, okay? Um, now, the, what's the accident? The accident was that Robert Kennedy, his brother, was not only, I mean, served under Joe McCarthy, and, but even liked him all the way up to the end. I mean, they were just friends. That's it, Robert Kennedy and, and Joe McCarthy. So you would, th you know, that's, okay, from our point of view, I'm, a lot of people's point of view anyway, that's, that's a pretty negative thing you'd think about. Uh, the other thing is that Jack Kennedy himself didn't do much about, about Joe McCarthy. He had cordial relations, not like his brother did, but he, he was in good terms with the guy and didn't do much to have any disrespect paid to Joe McCarthy. So that's one message that made him, that made it an accident. The accident is that the powers that be, this military industrial complex in the United States, weren't, wasn't sensitive to this guy not being anti-communist. I'm talking about Jack Kennedy now. They were not sensitive to they may be dealing with somebody different from whom, whom they thought they were dealing with. They thought they were dealing with a full-fledged anti-communist. Secondly, and I think this is important at a personal level, and I'm, and I'm pulling a lot of this out of the book I cite here. That's a Jim Douglas book, um, JFK and the Unspeakable, Why He Died and Why It Matters, um, that Kennedy was ill for much of his life from various things, and, and this P.T. boat thing that everybody knows about was a real hero thing. I mean, it wasn't, it was no fake thing. It was a real hero activity trying to save the people on the boat. Uh, he did things that led, I can't remember the exact details, but he led things, he did things that really came close to death for him. And he experienced death, it, issues of his own death many times in his life. I mean, he just came close ahead of time, which means that according to Jim Douglas, and I b believe that would be correct, he simply passed beyond the point of worrying about his own death. And it's, I mean, I think it, it's hard to, you know, I don't know how to say it, but it, it's important, his, his, that personal accident is totally different from a guy like George Bush, any of the George Bushes, but, you know, specifically, <laughs> specifically the last George Bush, okay? I mean, it's, it's uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, I don't want to belabor that point too much because I will burn up too much time. Anyway, so... A whole bunch of things happen in the Kennedy administration, and I'm going to tell you right up front, right away, I'm not going to talk about him getting, I'm not going to talk about how he got assassinated. Jim Douglas did, did talk about it. I'm going to say he was assassinated by the CIA. Okay, put it out there right now. So, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just saying that's what I think is correct. <laughs> I'm going to talk about who the enemies Kennedy made. Okay, I'm talking about the, the enemies he made who had it against him. I'm not going to talk about the mafia. Okay? <laughs> First, Bay of Pigs. Bay of Pigs was April 15th, to 19, this is 15th to 19, 1961, three months after he got into office, a legacy of Eisenhower. The critical point that I want to make about the Bay of Pigs, and I'm not going to, I don't need a lot of discussion because everybody knows that it was a failure, okay? But the CIA tried to set Kennedy up. They tried to set him up in the following way. And to, to, uh, he, they wanted him to agree that American uh, troops would land on Cuba. He refused. But they, you know, as I makes sense from their point of view, I'm going to leverage this guy to do it anyway. We're going to have a situation, and if it comes to it, we're going to tell him, we're like, we have to have American troops enter into Cuba because otherwise it's going to be a defeat. And that's exactly, I mean, what happened is that they were defeated on 
the Cuban shores, and now the CIA officials, Alan Douglas, Dulles in particular, and the two subordinates, two deputy directors of the CIA, pressured Kennedy like crazy to intervene, and he refused. Okay, he refu he accepted defeat, the American defeat against this stupid little guy Castro. Okay, I mean it's I mean from the CIA point of view, it was outrageous. I mean, I'm really being, I'm trying to be dramatic here because it was dramatic, okay? They were furious with Kennedy. Kennedy's own reaction was about being set up by his own CIA three months after he's in office was outrage against the CIA. He then says to somebody um, uh, privately that he intended to splinter the CIA in a thousand pieces and scatter it to the wind. Now, of course, this is an exaggeration, but that's what he said. Uh, that's expression of how angry he was at the CIA, and they, in turn, were angry at him. He fired Alan Dulles. He fired um, the two de de deputy directors of the CIA. That's, I mean, this is <laughs> big time stuff, okay? He cuts the budget of the CIA, okay? Um, Furthermore, at the same time, this is still in 1961, he agrees in June of 1961 with Khrushchev for a neutral Laos. Remember I just said that, that Eisenhower had told him he should be fighting the communists in Laos, and he's agreeing to a neutral Laos, okay? He had actually said something in the same, in the same vein in March of the same year, but so we're getting, we're getting the CIA really angry at this guy. Secondly, totally different ballgame. The, the industrialist. Um, today, maybe we wouldn't even think that this was such a big deal, but there was an effort, and there was a concern about inflation. Kennedy makes a deal, he thinks, with the steel executives, um, whose name I can't remember right now, or the steel, but it doesn't matter. With, this, with the U.S. steel president and some uh, any, uh, steel executives that they would not raise steel prices in return and that the workers would get certain concessions. So in other words, the deal was between the workers and the steel owners and Kennedy. The steel owners reneged. This is April um, 6th. April 10th, I think it's Blau is the guy, the B-L-O-U-G-H, is the head of, of U.S. steel or whatever the name was at that time. He comes, he comes into Kennedy's office, okay, with a piece of paper, handing out a press release that's being distributed at the same moment to the press, saying we are raising steel prices by an average of 3.5%, which for you may be, what, you know, what's the big deal, okay? Kennedy was furious, okay, because it was a double cross. Is it like what is happening, what the CIA did? I mean, the CIA tried to leverage... The president now steel maggots are trying mangans. You know what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> We're trying to do the same thing, okay? And they were testing him. And this again, this comes back to why I think Kennedy was an accident of history. I mean, he had guts. I mean, that profiles and courage is not a mistake in some sense, okay? But and there's reasons for it, okay? Anyway, so. What does Kennedy do? They come announcement on April 10th, April 3rd, and so what does he do? Unheard of. Can you imagine Obama doing something like the following? He cancels orders that the military had made to all steel manufacturers who, were, who had agreed to the price increase and switches the orders to the small steel manufacturers who hadn't gotten a part of the deal. And he sends his brother, or his brother does it on his own, to have a, jur a grand jury investigation of price fixing. I mean, I mean, what more can you want? I mean, you know, anyway, so they were, what did they do? They retreated. They canceled the price increase three days later. They didn't forget. And they even got it nailed down further of what side Kennedy was seemed to be on when just a couple of weeks afterwards, uh, this is on April 23rd, the New York Times uh, drops a little sentence that Kennedy had said during this episode. And this is now, you're talking about Jack Kennedy, talking about Joe Kennedy, his father, who everybody has some opinion about, perhaps, okay? <laughs> okay. 
So what's Jack Kennedy say about Joe Kennedy? My father always told me that all businessmen were sons of bitches, <laughs> but I never believed them until now. <laughs> That's in the New York Times, OK? So you can imagine what all the leading capitalists are now thinking about Kennedy. This guy is out of control. I mean, I mean you know, so the CIA is thinking he's out of control. The business leaders, I mean, the industrial leaders are thinking this guy's out of control. And it's true. He's out of control, OK? Um, so the next thing I want to mention, of course, and I'm going to mention three more. I mean, I've got to move along here. But the next is the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't need to say too much about that because you kind of probably are kind of aware of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, but let me just say that the, that the military commanders, um, Joint Chiefs of Staff, really wanted to go to war with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Russia on this. I mean, they, they in public, that, that they didn't do anything like that. But in private, they were furious that there was a deal made with that damn communist, OK? Uh, uh, several years ago, like in uh, 1992, it came out that the Soviets were not bluffing. We had our nuclear missiles in Turkey, but they had their nuclear missiles in Cuba. And they had 162 of them ready to fire. I mean, it wasn't, it, it was serious stuff. It was even more serious. Than we, than we might have thought at the time, OK? And th what does that mean? That means that Kennedy might have saved a lot of our lives in this room right now, OK? Certainly saved how, you know, I mean, we, whatever. Uh, you get, for Kennedy to stand up to, the, to that in that situation was more praiseworthy than we might have even known at the time, given what we found out about the, the real situation. It was not a bluff on the part of the Soviets or the United States that we had missiles aimed at each other and blah, blah, blah. OK, that's, that's Cuban Missile Crisis. Next thing is, in uh, June 10, 1963, Kennedy gives a speech before the uh, American University graduating class, which is an explicit call for self-examination by Americans about the Cold War and calling for a movement toward peace. Now, that's also extraordinary, OK? He also calls for, uh, he also stops American nuclear test, uh, testing. It's extraordinary because he it takes a real step, a real anti-anti-anti-anti-communist anti step, OK? In other words, he's fighting anti-communism by saying, think about yourself. What are you really doing, OK? Um, that speech got very little attention in the United States. It got more attention in the Soviet Union than in the United States. Um, I want to make a couple of other comments in connection with this, that the Joint Chiefs of Ch Staff twice went into Kennedy and, and specifically asked him to authorize a preemptive nuclear attack on the Soviet Union First, by the end of 1963, when they thought that that would be the, the low point of the Soviet capacity to retaliate. First proposal was do it by the end of 1963. What do you think Kennedy's reaction was? I'm talking about a guy out of control, OK? <laughs> Kennedy's reaction was to walk out of the room. And then he said to Dean Rusk, his Secretary of State, and we think we are the human race. That's a, okay. They come back to him later for the same purpose to get him to do a nuclear, uh, a preemptive nuclear strike. But at a late, I mean, I think the time horizon was 64 to 68 or something like that. He rejects it again. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is um, that about Vietnam. It is true that we did not have military troops in Vietnam when Kennedy came into office. It is true that we started getting military advisors. It's true that the military advisors got up to 16,500 by his death. Uh, but it's also true that um, he perceived, Kennedy perceived that this, that he had reasons to think that this was, that making it a full out, full out land war would be a huge mistake. And so he began to reverse the policy, starting with an explicit order 
to reduce 1,000 of those 16,500 by the end of 1963. His intention was to have a further reduction in 64, but not tell the public that we're getting out of Vietnam until after he got reelected, which he obviously didn't get reelected, but that was the strategy, okay? In other words, he was giving a message. Now, if you remember, there was two um, senators who opposed the Gulf of Tonkin resolution when it came in, uh, um, when it came, uh, brought forth by President Johnson. One was uh, Ernest Gruning from Oregon, and the other was Wayne Morris from Alaska. Kennedy was speaking with Wayne Morris in October or November of 1963, and he tells Wayne Morris, we are getting out of Vietnam, point blank. Okay, and Wayne Morris, when he hears it, he, he can't believe his ears, and he asked him to repeat it. And in, uh, in another, and Kennedy uh, confirmed to him that that's what the long, that's what the longer term strategy was. So that's another. I mean, the military had to know that things were not going well with their Vietnam strategy. And of course, the moment that Johnson gets into office, of course, he re he cancels that one thousand dollar reduction. You know, everything happens happens after that. I mean, Johnson goes in completely the. For, in completely the opposite direction. Um, also, kind of a minor detail. Do you remember, uh, or you read about President Sukarno? So President Sukarno was a head of Indonesia and a kind of pro, I mean, I don't, I don't know if he was a communist, but he certainly was not an anti-communist. He was working with an allies with, for example, with, with, with China and so forth and so on. Kennedy was, ex was just on the verge, I don't know if it actually happened, just on the verge of accepting an invitation from President Sukarno to visit Indonesia in the spring of 64, okay? Another message of what, how, what this guy's mentality was. His mentality was in the direction of trying to understand other people, and he was making overtures to Castro in Cuba in the direction of, I, I'm beginning to understand why Cuba did what it did, where the U.S. responsibility was and where Cuba uh, has a gripe, if you want to put it mildly, against the United States. So, he gets, so anyway, I'm trying to give you enough points that really angered the powers that be, that military industrial establishment, to get rid of this guy, period. I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to try and recite how it was done in detail, but it was not done by Lee Harvey Oswald, okay? And I would comment, I, I cite the book here, this Douglas book, he has, I mean, it's, it's basically, an, uh, he closes the case of how it was done. And I'll just mention one thing in that book that I never read before. There was a guy on the bridge overlooking Dealey Plaza who was a deaf mute. The deaf mute saw the shots going from the uh, oak, uh, from the um, grassy knoll. knoll, right? Saw the shots come out. His father told his his son, "Do not tell people this because you're going to get wiped out." Okay, so he kept him from saying that. His father finally died, and after his father died, sometime after that, the son finally reports what he observed uh, on that day. Yeah. So, and there's many other things like that. But uh, for example, there's another thing uh, that's in the book is an exact description of how they got a Harvey Oswald lookalike out of Dallas on that day. And that's a, it's, it's a lot of things there, but if you just read, read the description of what happened, it will be, I think, convincing. Okay. Now we come to Martin Luther King. I'm not going to go through Martin Luther King's assassination. I want to say that it is all as close as another shock. Whether it's the same level, a little bit above or a little bit below Kennedy, I don't care about. Okay, it's a it's another big shock. I don't. By the way, I don't mention here Robert Kennedy because by that time we're getting so used to getting people getting wiped out that we're not quite so shocked anymore. Uh, I mean, we were shocked, but not so shocked. Okay. Um, also, frankly, I don't have. I don't, have the, I don't have a story to tell about Kennedy's assassination. I do have a story to tell about Martin Luther King's assassination. It turns out that this same guy, Jim Douglas, who writes about Kennedy, observed in person the only trial that was ever undertaken about the assassination of Martin Luther King. He sat there from the beginning to the end. 
he was shocked because he was the only person who, besides one, I think, one Portuguese reporter who stayed through the whole trial, okay? He was sitting there by himself most of the time. What happens? The King family decides that they, that they against, against advice of other people and blah, 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 uh, that they're going to get their family in trouble, it says, no, I want to take this case to court. Now, it turns out, I guess, that you can't prosecute the United States government for conspiracy. I don't know what the law is, but some, it's, it, it, somehow there's an, an actual barrier to doing that, okay? Uh, so they couldn't do that. But there was like an accomplice who, to the United States, who, at this point an alleged accomplice to the United States government's operation, who you could prosecute, okay? So they prosecute the small guy in order to get to the big guy, <laughs> okay? But, but implicitly. And, and it is a conviction, okay? I mean, I, I cite what the judge says. The judge, the judge is an, uh, an older black guy. He's just about ready to retire. He's probably a very gentle guy, but probably pretty solid down, down, below, down below or whatever, okay? He's reading the jury verdict against the, the small guy, and then he gets to the big point, which, I mean, they're reading two, two, two uh, accusations, two charges, and the jury, uh, the judge reads the second thing. It's on, I, I think I put it there. Do you find, also find that others, including government agencies, were parties to this conspiracy as alleged by the defendant? Your answer to that one is also yes. He's reading, he's reading the yes and the charge that he's, that's being answered yes to, okay? And I mean, I'm just going to ask you, how many people know that this trial took place? Just know that it took place. See, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I mean, why? I mean, in three days on Monday is the anniversary of this guy's assassination, okay? And you're not going to hear about a, a, a fully constituted trial and conviction of agents of the United States government in being involved in it. And, and, and again, I don't want to, I, I mean, I read I, I, the evidence, and there's a major pieces of evidence about it, I can't even remember it all, I'll just give you a couple. And that is, the, the shots were supposed to be fired from one direction, but there's a picture showing that if the four people who are showing where the shots come from is pointing in another direction. That's not so significant, maybe. But the very next day, okay, the very next day there's, there's a whole bunch of shrubbery, which is, which, is, which is where the shots probably really came from. I mean, it is where the shots came from. All kinds of shrubbery over the, over the hotel. They were all cut down the very next morning, okay? That means that somebody ordered the tampering of, of, of evidence of a crime the very next morning, okay? Another thing that happens, which is uh, also kind of sad, the owner of the hotel, the Lorraine Hotel, is a Muslim husband and wife, okay? They're, they're getting a phone call. We want to put up Martin Luther King Jr. in your hotel, okay? So they arranged to put Martin Luther King down on the first floor of that hotel because they thought that was the most secure room. They get a phone call. The, 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 the owners of the hotel get a phone call from somebody alleging to be in the Martin Luther King's entourage saying, no, Kennedy, I mean, King wants to be upstairs in the balcony. They say, no, that's not so secure. We don't want to go there. But it was an insistence that it, he goes upstairs to the balcony, OK? And obviously, he gets wiped out in the balcony, OK? Do you know what happened to, that, to the woman of that, uh, of that hotel? She died of a heart attack the very next day because of what happened. Because she felt re the, the sense of responsibility of not having stopped that from happening, OK? Uh, OK, I don't want to go through any more of that because I'm getting to the big one. I'm getting to a bigger one, 9-11, OK? You're not going to like what I say about 9-11 either, I don't think, OK? <laughs> uh, just let me say, uh, I'm skipping the election fraud that occurred in the year 2000 election. That's, it's frankly kind of smaller potatoes, but I just wanted to have it listed in, in, in my list here. We get to 9-11, and that's where I've published a book called The Hidden History of 9-11. I mean, I edited the book, and I have a chapter in it, and it's more the economics of, of background behind insider trading before 9-11. Um, but so anyway, I've done a lot of work on that, so I'm going to spend a little bit of, you know, I don't know, how, how much am I running time-wise here? 
Okay, I, I'll try and do this in 10 minutes, something okay. like that. I'm okay? Okay. 9-11, uh, I mean, uh, let me just say, first of all, um, I, I'm not going to go through the whole story. I'm going I'm, to mention a few things. And you get ready for the uh, video, who's ever, where are you? Where are you? Yeah, okay, it's going to be in about a couple, it's a couple, couple minutes, okay. Uh, how do you know that 19 mostly Saudis were hijackers on 9-11? How do you know that there were 19 Arab, mostly Saudis, hijackers on planes on 9-11? I heard on Fox News. Huh? No, 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 no. It is Fox News, but that's, no. That's why they say them in the Okay, now, we're, I mean, most of us here, are, we're in an educational environment, okay? So we are supposed to be doing things objectively. I mean, we're supposed to be critical, okay? This goes beyond the issue of critical. If you go to the 9-11 Commission report and just simply read what they say about who, who these guys were, I mean, I'm really, just do it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Just look at, those, at the evidence for the, each of those names. The answer is they don't even try. They don't even try to provide evidence for any one of the 19. Just read the report yourself. They take those names and run with it. It's an, I mean, I, I am really, it's, for me, it's an outrage. It's a real outrage. It's a, it's, it's a violation of my sense of justice for anybody accused of anything, okay? It's an, also in this, it's a violation of my sense of, of objectivity and, and just basic ways you do something, okay? You don't just skip over the single most important issue because if somebody else did it, the Japanese who are hated us after the Second World War, maybe they did it, okay? I'm not saying they did it, okay? You get the <laughs> idea, okay? I say that because my uncle hated the Japanese, so I figured the Japanese might hate the Americans, okay? <laughs> so, I mean, anything is kind of possible. I mean, I, 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 okay, what, so I found that an outrage. Now, I didn't write the first chapter in this book, but I wrote the second one. But the first one has a picture of one of those hijackers. It's, it's the hijacker who supposedly had the plane that went uh, down in Pennsylvania, okay? The, that's his picture. Actually, it's not his picture. It's a picture of three different people, all labeled the same name, all uh, except one of these, these uh, one, two, three, seven, six, six of the seven pictures are official pictures. Only one of them is an unofficial picture, but they're three different individuals, okay? And, and you're getting this from governments or newspapers' reports about this individual, okay? And that's one thing. Second thing is, what would you say if I said to you that there are 19 hijackers and 9, 10, 3, 7 raised their hand after 9-11 and said, hey, what are you accusing me of? I'm, I'm alive. I'm sitting here. I'm in Saudi Arabia. I'm whatever I am, okay? I'm in L.A. or whatever. I'm somewhere. What would you say? You'd say, wow, God, yeah, that, that, that does it, you know? That's what happened, okay? Ten of, uh, nine or ten, I think it's ten, ten of the 19 people who are accused, and the accusation was not just a name. It's not a transliteration issue. It's a picture. It's the description of where they worked or where they went to school or where they, what country they were in or whatever. It was more than just, you know, a name. Ten of those people are reported in the BBC, in the Independent, I think it is, in the LA Times, in a Saudi newspaper, in one of the places I can't remember, saying, I did not do it. I am here. Why are you accusing me? That's not even, I mean, let's, let's suppose that every one of those people, there's a lie or some problem with every one of the stories. At a minimum, you would expect the 9-11 Commission report to deal with each one of those cases. And they didn't, they didn't, didn't even mention it. Okay. Uh, I think, well, I, I, there's another, by the way, there's another factor. Some of these passports, of the, some of these individuals claim that their passports were stolen, okay? 
Uh, so it could be anybody else. It could be anybody. FBI director even says somewhere along the way we can't really prove these names because there were passports stolen and there, you know whatever. Okay. I mean, there's so many possibilities of who was actually on those planes that I'm not even going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, whatever. Um, now, next thing is about the commission report is that they tell you that there's two buildings that, that came down in free fall speed, more or less, almost free fall speed, straight down. It never happened before. It never happened before. So I'm supposed to believe that it happened now? Now, I will tell you, I was beginning to look at this about January, February of, 19, of 2002. By October of 2002, I still did not know that there was a third building that went down just like the first two buildings went down. Okay? I still did not know. Nine months after I was looking at it fairly carefully. Why? Because it was so hidden that there was, a, that there was anything else going on that, that even I was not exposed. I'm not trying to praise myself. I'm trying to say, you know, what the normal American people are expo well, not exposed to. Okay? The third building is a 47-story building called World Trade Center 7, okay, which also falls down on its, on its own footprint at free fall speed, and there is no plane that hit it. And the pictures of fires are not very, the fires are nowhere near very dramatic, and there's buildings all over the world which have had much more fires and didn't fall on their footprint and blah, blah, blah. Okay? It's absolutely unbelievable that you could try and make the case that that was not some kind of demolition operation. So I'm just going to give you two minutes now, just do the first one, two minutes of that building, because I'm doing it because you won't see it anyplace else except if you start going on the internet. So he's going to show you just two minutes video about building. If you were told it was something else, you wouldn't believe it, would you? This is called visual identification based on experience. Now, this building is about to be destroyed in what is called a controlled demolition. Buildings do not do this spontaneously. Here is another example of a controlled demolition. The initial charges are spaced about one second apart. And you can see that each section begins falling separately. Successful demolitions require that all structural support columns collapse at virtually the same time. If they don't, or if something else goes wrong, the result looks something like this. This is World Trade Center 7 just before it collapsed on September the 11th, 2001. It had not been hit by an aircraft. It had been damaged by falling debris and fire. But by 5.20 p.m., most of the fires had been extinguished. Although the building was 47 stories high, it doesn't fall sideways, nor collapse unevenly. For this to have happened, all of the building's vertical supports must have given way at almost exactly the same time. Yet the Federal Emergency Management Agency reported that the collapse was due primarily to fire. But what does it look like to you? As of July 2007, there is no final report on the collapse of World Trade Center 7, but the National Institute of Standards and Technology still rules out a controlled demolition. So the question is, do you believe what you can see with your own eyes, or do you believe what you are told? Okay, what were you told about World Trade Center 7 in the 9-11 Commission report? Ask again, what were you told about World Trade Center 7 in the 9-11 Commission report? Huh? You were not told anything about World Trade Center. It was, they, they said that about one and two. They ignored World Trade Center 7. They ignored what you just saw. Okay? I mean, I, that's another, absolute, for me, absolutely unbelievable thing to not even mention that it happened, okay? Uh, by the way, it happened at 5.20 in the afternoon. We, now this is, get this, I mean, there's lots of things to talk about, so I can't do everything, but it happened at 5.20 in the afternoon. I think it was supposed to happen much earlier, and where the demolition charges that were set up, 
it failed to go off and they had to play around a little bit to get it to happen. And because otherwise, if it had happened at the same time as the World Trade Center 1 and 2, nobody would ever know that it was, there was any demolition of World Trade Center 7. 7. That's my opinion. I don't know. But around 4.55, five minutes before 5, BBC has a video, has a news report, sorry, has a news report with a, uh, with a news person standing in, 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 in front of the camera, the World Trade Center 7 in the background saying the World Trade Center had just demolished. 25 minutes before it happens. Okay. Uh, now, the, the, the third thing I want to mention, um, yeah, I have just put it down there. This is more controversial because it's a, a little bit kind of new evidence. But there were some people who, I mean, there's people who claim that oh, a plane did not hit the Pentagon. It had to be something else, okay? There's, so other people say these people are crazy who say there was no plane that hit the Pentagon. So there's some, a couple of guys who actually probably, or oh, well, whatever, I mean, it came out from L.A. and decided that they wanted to interview people who were there and just ask, they, they looked at exactly the flight path that the commission report says the plane took on, on, to the Pentagon. And then they asked people in the area, well, where, I mean, uh, people who saw the plane, where did the plane go from where you, from your point of view? Now, I can't go through the, the, the 12 or 13 witnesses they had, but they all said the same thing. They, gave, they said the plane, there was a Sitco station right across from the Pentagon. And there's two police officers, okay, police officers, okay, who were take, getting gas there or whatever they were doing at the gas station. They interview them. The interview says the plane came to our left. That means to the north side of the Sitco gas station. If it goes to the north side of the Sitco gas station, that means it could not go to the south side of the Sitco gas station. If it didn't go to the south side of the Sitco gas station, it could not hit the light poles and go into the Pentagon the way it's described. Okay? I don't want to belabor this one because I say this is, this is a little bit more new evidence, but I, this is another piece of, of evidence that there's serious, serious problems with the 9-11 Commission report. Okay, so what's the conclusion? I mean, the conclusion, from my point of view, okay, my, my, my conclusion is that it was done by an inside job. Okay, I, I, nasty people. Okay, and I'm not the whole government. There's holes in your holes. In I'm sure there's holes in my argument. Will you, we'll have a question and answer period afterwards. I'll okay. try and deal with it, you know, you know whatever, okay? Um, I tried to lead up to that because by doing Kennedy and other stuff, and it sort of really you put myself really against the wall for you guys because you can hit me on every one of these things, okay? <laughs> Martin Luther King also, okay? <laughs> whatever, okay? Now, so the last thing I come to now is, the, is what the title of the talk is. The title of the talk is what underlies our current economic crisis. Now, um, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to go to the next video, but not quite yet, okay? Um, go back to the 1930s. Roosevelt establishes the, um, the uh, I mean, excuse me, the, the Glass-Steingall uh, legislation was passed, which separates commercial banking from uh, uh, risky banking or investment banking, okay? And that's what we lived, all we, we all grew up under that, okay? Now, um, in 1981, Reagan comes into office. Reagan is an Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrug type of guy. Actually, I think that we should have paid more attention to this issue when, when, it, was, when it was happening than I did, okay? Uh, but we didn't, okay? He appoints uh, along, somewhere along the way Alan Greenspan who's also the same kind of guy. We, again, we didn't pay enough attention to the, to the mentality of these guys. So anyway, Reagan's mentality was deregulation everywhere, okay? He, I mean, we knew that, that he said deregulate all over the place, okay? But he didn't, he didn't accomplish deregulation of the financial sector. It's just a fact. I mean, he, he, he wanted it, but he didn't do everything he wanted. He didn't accomplish everything he wanted. He didn't accomplish the deregulation of the banking sector, okay? I don't know anything about Bush second, 
uh, whether he made any effort in it or not. I mean, excuse me, Bush first, uh, whether he made any effort on, on it or not. I, what I've been reading, uh, he's passed over till we get to Kennedy, I mean, see, to Clinton, okay? Clinton wants to be the new Democrat, okay? And uh, so we have a set of guys who are going to perform an operation. And these guys are Robert Rubin, who's going to be the Secretary of Treasury, and he has two deputies, Larry Summer and uh, Timothy Geidner. Okay, those are the three people in the Treasury Department. Okay, and those names might be familiar to you. Okay, because <laughs> they're in Obama's administration, have been in Obama's administration also. I, I, this this is the book I'm relying upon. A really nice book, very easy to read. The Great American Stick Up. Okay, basically the stick up was we these guys and other people say we have to get rid of. Glass-Steagall restriction on commercial and, and, and investment banking. We have to merge, a lot of them do whatever they want. Not have a restriction on a commercial bank not being able to do risky uh, investment banking. Pull, let them have a holding company. They were supported by a Senator Graham and even perhaps, uh, it leaks equally interesting, his wife, Wendy Graham, okay? Wendy Graham was head of, was in charge of under, I guess this is under Reagan, maybe under Bush, partly under uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which was primarily focused on, so supposedly, on agricultural issues, okay? So, but she pushes like crazy everything in the deregulation. She's a fanatic, Ayn Rand kind of person. Also, deregulate everything, okay? When Clinton comes into office, he appoints a woman named um, Bourne, and let me remember her first name. Um, maybe it's not so important, but uh, uh, Brooksley Bourne. Brooksley Bourne gets appointed to that same, as a chair of the same commission by Clinton. Now, Clinton, from a certain point of view, can be said to make a mistake because this woman is tough nails. I mean, she knows what a derivative is. She sees a, way ahead of time that this is dynamite, okay? And she warns and warns and warns that, and she intends to investigate. She didn't ask for legislation. She just simply wants to investigate the unrestricted use of de de derivatives and the dangers for the American financial system if it were to continue. She gets leveraged by these guys in the Clinton administration and basically gets defeated on the issue, e even to the point where they get a law passed prohibiting, prohibiting, pro prohibiting the commission to even investigate the problems with derivatives. I mean, I'm not talking about legislation, I'm talking about just investigation. They prohibited her from investigating. To her credit, she never backed off. I mean, she stayed with her, but even, and she got, I mean, these big guys, and there's, some of them are big guys, you know? I mean, she stayed with, she stayed with her, you know, whatever. Um, so, um, I, I can now probably pull it together in about five more minutes, because what I need to say is, how did they accomplish it under the, uh, the Clinton administration? What they did is about, as you get toward the end of the uh, Kennedy, uh, Clinton administration, you get 98 and 99, okay? They're still really moving to try and get this, this deregulation occurring. Citicorp is a commercial bank. Travelers Group is a risky, is, is a, excuse me, is a investment bank. They merge, which would be a violation of Glass-Steagall, except that they got an exemption for two years before they would come under the restrictions of Glass-Siegel. This is now 98. In other words, they leveraged, they did it anyway and got a grace period of two years. The two years giving them the time to, to, get, to get their act together to get the law changed, okay? Did they get the law changed? Well, then you get, what's interesting here is, is that Larry, um, Robert Rubin is a big time, is a big time operator around this thing, connected to you know, all, all the other investment banks and stuff like that. 
but he, he moves out of the Treasury Secretary to Goldman Sachs, I think it's Goldman Sachs, or maybe it's Citicorp. Well, it's now called Citigroup because it's merged. And he puts Summers in. Uh, Summers takes his place. And Summers is even more uh, effective in getting this law changed. But they run into a problem. The problem is the Black Caucus in Congress is worried that, th that this combination is going to lead to even more redlining of, of, of home mortgages in black areas. So what do they do? The head of Citicorp is a guy named Weil, W-E-I-L-L, -L, CEO, Citicorp. He calls up Jesse Jackson. They had been friends. They had, I mean, Weil had done some things in the quote in the black, that Jackson wanted in the black community. So Weil calls up and returns the favor and says, give me, give, give me a support for elimination, or for the, the Financial Services Modernization Act, which would get rid of Glass-Steagall. And Jesse Jackson says, sure, and he does it. Okay, and then the law passes. Okay, that's 98. We come to the end of Kennedy, uh, Ken, uh, Clinton's term in, uh, in year 2000, and we're now up against one more problem that, that they would like to solve, and that is that there still could be restrictions on derivatives. So they're proposing another law. The law would be the, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. Everything's modernization, OK? The Commodity Futures Modernization Act, as it is called, OK? And that gets passed two days, or the second or third day before the last day of Congress when Clinton's in office. <coughs> and now we've got a clean, boat, and we've got a clean sweep of deregulation. And uh, now I come back to what I said before, okay? namely what uh, Warren Buffett had said, namely that we have now in place a financial weapon of mass destruction. Now show the second video. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Send it back to you, Margaret, in New York. 
Okay, so now I just want to make the last point I want to make, uh, remind you of this sentence by Warren Buffett. If Warren Buffett realizes in 2002, which is about the time this came, uh, no, it's way before this came out, okay, which would be probably last year, um, that derivatives are a financial weapon of mass destruction. And was he the only guy in the world who ever thought that that was a financial uh, a, a weapon of mass destruction? Um, I think not. Okay, I don't know who else did, uh, but this guy might have thought the same thing. Okay, uh, Bourne might have thought the same thing. Okay, now now I'm going to go in the direction that you want me to go in. I'm not going to accuse the government of of, of engineering a shock, <laughs> but I'm not saying that they did. Just a second, I'm not saying that they didn't either. I just simply don't know. That's why I have a question mark at the end of my uh, title of my talk. I don't know. Did it happen by what we might think of as a structural economic reason which nobody really could control? It just kind of happened as an outcome of deregulation? Or was, the, or was there somebody behind the scenes that was, quote, setting it up? I don't know. But given my own reading of the history of the United States, I at least asked the question. That's all. Yeah. Just just a couple of tidbits. The Marine uh, Commandant uh, with respect Butler, to the yeah. coup against Roosevelt was Smedley D. Butler. He wrote a book entitled War is a Racket. There's another book out, The Plot Against the White House, about the coup. <coughs> yeah. okay. Information. Yeah. yeah. Um, I needed a little more uh, explanation on uh, World Trade Center 7. And the BBC reporter, I didn't quite catch this. The, he said that that five minutes before it happened, he said twenty-five that, minutes. Okay, that that World Trade Center seven came down, or that the World yes. Trade Center one and two came down. Seven. So it says it says there's a name to the building I can't remember right now, but it, the reporter is saying I, I, I the reporter is saying that whatever the name of the building is, I can't remember <laughs> that building. It's in the background. She's saying it has just been reported that that building has collapsed, so she's, and the building is in their background. So she's reporting from a feed instead of from her own observations. Must be. What do you? Uh, so she can see the building behind her, can't she? Well, maybe she's just she's just showing the viewer. This is the building that came down. No, but it's a, she's saying it before it came down. So the other buildings came down. The other point of the buildings came down. Well, How would she know that that building was going to come down before it came down? Right. Better take a look. I don't know. Better take a look at what she said to make sure that she was talking about Building 7 and not the other ones. The other thing is that with respect to Building 7, um, the way the buildings are structured, there's, there's concrete floors. Those are essentially like fire walls. If there was a fire in one floor, and it could be a very intense fire depending on where it is, it could melt the beams and it could come down in that manner. Uh, and it, the firefighters, the investigators can easily tell if it's been a beam has been blown or burned through. So I don't buy that. If they said that it's been burned through, that's pretty easily identifiable. Now, maybe they didn't tell the truth, but what's the evidence of that? So. What's the evidence that they didn't tell the truth? That's your question, okay? Uh, let me just ask you, if you were doing an investigation of murder via, via a destruction of a building, two buildings, three buildings, whatever, um, how might that destruction take place? One way it might take place is by dynamite, some kind of charges put in the building, right? No, no, I mean, just a second, okay? Sure. If you're doing a serious investigation, you would look at all possibilities. So one possibility you look at is, well, well let's look in the dust, okay? I happen to know somebody who collected the dust in her own uh, apartment right across from the World Trade Center. I don't know if it's one or two. She lived on the fourth floor. The, the debris came into her apartment. She almost died herself and her boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. She collected the debris. She gives the debris to a physicist who analyzes what's in the debris to see if what's in the debris. The 9-11, uh, the, the, the investigators, the scientists, for the government has refused to even do that check. 
So these independent, wait a minute, just a second. These independent faculty members like myself did, who are physicists, I mean, who know how to do this kind of checking, checked it themselves and found thermite in, in a, a highly explosive military grade compound all over, not just in that particular sample, but in other samples that they were able to get. And the commission didn't even, I mean, not the commission, the commission wouldn't be doing that because they're not scientists, but the, the people who were doing that were not even looking at that, or if they looked at it, they didn't tell anybody they did it. I don't know. Thermite in the plane? <laughs> where, did the, where did the dust come from? Did it come from Towers 1 and 2 or Building 7? I don't know. Okay. Well, it wouldn't matter. Because if it came from any of the buildings and it was thermite, that raises it could a been, serious question. But it could have been thermite in the plane. Yeah. And that raises another question. They only had box cutters. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the box cutters thing is only about one of the planes. Okay, they only it only was thrown out as an issue about hijackers on one of the planes, and even the other three planes didn't even talk about it. Yeah. Uh, do you read anything, or could you elaborate on? I, I I think I, I saw in a movie somewhere or something, a theory that somebody had an insurance policy or something out on these buildings. We just saw this movie, like Capitalism, A Love Story, where people were taking on insurance, corporations were taking on insurance policies on people, That's the guy getting rich off of them. The I've heard yeah. the theory that, yeah, they, they, the same thing was happening with the, uh, the World Trade Towers. Yeah, it's not, it's not theory. It's actually, uh, what's his name? It's, I'll think of it in a second. But there is a guy who, who got a lease, a hundred or something, a hundred year lease on World Trade Center one and two, uh, like six weeks before it happened, including an exemption in the lease for having to pay for the <coughs> lease and getting compensated if something happened to the towers, which is exactly what happened. Okay, I mean, he got billions of dollars as a result of the, these buildings collapsing. But so, yes, it actually did. I mean, nobody denies that. I mean, denial of, I mean, it had. I was wondering if you could comment on Dr. King's assassination. Do you believe, I know at the time he was organizing labor in Memphis. Yes. When he was killed, do you believe that was the reason? No, I think it was, I think Vietnam it was. Vietnam protesting that. A, a one year ago, his first address against the Vietnam War was exactly one year before April 4th, 1968, when he was killed. Namely, it was April 4th, 1967, that he gave his first speech against the Vietnam War. I, I, I think that was, okay. you know. Yeah. With respect to 9-11, was, with your reading, is Osama bin Laden a kind of scapegoat, a convenience used by, uh, to, you know, to push forward other agenda policies? Or was he, I mean, because he confessed in a sense, right? So was the, you know. How do you know he confessed? Well, I thought I saw him confessing. I, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, did he come to Buffalo? <laughs> no, I don't live in Buffalo. <laughs> You're right. I didn't talk to him. That's what you're saying. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just having fun, okay? <laughs> You think he confessed because there was a video release of somebody who looked like Osama bin Laden confessing, okay? In fact, what happened is that immediately after, I, first of all, let me just say, I don't really, I'm not very interested in the topic in any case, because if you think he's a son of a bitch, which probably most people would like to think in that, you don't really care whether he's a liar now and a truth teller, uh, a liar or a truth teller now because he could be the opposite later. I mean, he could be back and forth. I don't care. I don't know. Okay. So what he says doesn't matter to me. Okay. But what he did say was when it first happened, and this is, I mean, uh, this is well known. When it first happened, he said, we didn't do it. In fact, he was probably the night before in um, Kuwait getting dialysis and, and with a CIA guy visiting him. And, but that's another story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And there was a second video in which he says the same, which he says the same thing, you know. Doesn't say he like, he doesn't say he didn't like it or anything like that, but he didn't say he did it, okay. Then there's a third one that comes out which says he did do it, okay. People who have, and then I, I'm not an expert on videos, but that, that was a fake. For myself, I don't really care so much whether it was a fake or not, because I don't, it doesn't, why should he be telling the truth in any case? Or why, whatever. I mean, it just—it's it, not scientific evidence. It's a word of a mouth of a guy, you know. Yeah. But there are data about uh, removing his family members yeah. from the United States. Yes. yes. Uh, almost immediately after 9/11. Yes, in violation of the restriction of any air travel. Uh, yes. Right. Yes. Right. No fly zone. No fly zone. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
seven. I would, then the pictures you shot, these two questions. So if I saw that or somebody showed that to me, my question would be, who shot the video and how do I know that's the video? Because unless I've seen it personally or had some kind of identifier, I don't know that that's it. And somebody could have created that to influence me. So what I'm asking you is where it came from and how am I supposed to know that that's really the real building? Uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that, that question is not disputed. I mean, I, I mean, there's a huge number of, you can click on World Trade Center 7, yeah. and there's a lot of videos of it, but, even, but even, I pass even beyond all video evidence. There was a report, finally came out. There was never a report for a long time about World Trade Center 7 because they couldn't figure out what to say about World Trade Center 7. And this is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or I think NIST, who did it. Okay. Anyway, so they had a preliminary report about World Trade Center 7. And a preliminary report is subject to, to public discussion. They had a physicist from uh, but, uh, uh, in a high school named Chandler who calls up in Washington, D.C., an interview from L.A., and ask whether the first several seconds were genuinely free fall. If it's free fall, it means it's going at the sp accelerating at 32 feet per second per second, okay? That means there's no support underneath. There's no pancaking, which is a resistance. It's going, okay. And this, the final report is remarkable, actually. The final report says that the first 1.8 or 2.1 seconds is free fall, free fall about the same building. It's not, it's not disputed that we're talking about that, but I'm not, it's a fair question, but it's not something anybody's, can discuss, anybody's. You're saying there's nobody out there who's disputing that. As, 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 as building seven. Okay. I mean, that is building there seven. There multiple sources. Multiples, multiple, multiple, multiple. I mean, it's just not disputed, right? And the, the dispute is why, not what. That's fair. That's if you fair. show the video, you're going to say, well, right. you know, yeah. just, just like anything else, it could be that. I don't yeah, know. That's right. That's it could be. Right. It could be. Yeah, uh, like, was the building no. vacated? The building had been vacated. With the, so there's one, one report about one guy who didn't make it out. I, don't, I didn't follow that up very much. But yes, it, basically it was vacated. Okay. Um, but there was... Some report about one of the, there was two people who were trapped in a floor who wind up getting out and had, and had some statements contradictory to the, and I don't remember this too much, contradictory to uh, that this was an accident or whatever. And one of those two people died recently uh, in maybe unusual circumstances. Uh, I don't want to get into that because I don't really know enough about it. You sound like you, you've seen all this. I don't know. Okay, so I mean, are you saying that this is? But I'm saying, it, but. It, or and, and building seven was that done by terrorists, and maybe they had already set that up, and then went with the planes and the other two, or was this a larger uh, conspiracy or a larger plan? Uh, okay, I, I mean, yeah, I'm not doing. Uh, yeah, I should add something about World Trade Center 7. World Trade Center said had, had um, the bunker that Giuliani had set up for emergency control. In other words, it was an op a major operations center for any kind of emergency in New York City. That, that's number one. Number two, a huge amount of the investigative files of the financial regulator, whose name slips my mind right now, were destroyed in that fire with no duplicate copies anywhere in the United States. I personally know somebody who works at the Washington office of that same place. They went from file after file, closing files like on Enron and stuff like that because they, the, the date, the, 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 you know, that's the second thing. There's discussion also about the World Trade Center 1 and 2 that there was gold in the bottom of, of it and the gold just disappeared. Okay, I don't know. I mean, I know about it. I'm, I haven't pursued that very seriously. So. But you're asking me who did it? Um, yeah, I'm asking you what do you think in your, I mean, from your intellectual and scholarly analysis of what you've done 
and so far that many of us have not thought about or saw in the same way, what are you, I, I don't know that you're suggesting anything, but what would be your speculation? My speculation, and, I'm, and, and I really don't want, I because mean, anything I say about why, you some, huh? <laughs> Anything I say could be met by somebody, and it has, I've experienced it by somebody saying, but they could have done that in a different way than that. Okay, so I, I, having said that, I will say that the best way to look at it is everything that is, follows from 9-11, every, um, all the restrictions, all the wars, all, all this military, all this glorification of military industrial complex and billions and billions of dollars of profits they're flowing there from, it's a pretty good explanation if, you, if you're looking for something, okay? Yeah. Our control of oil is another, is a, other people go in that direction. We're looking for, we're going, we're tanking in oil, we need to have a replacement for oil. Or, um, or we need to, con Jimmy, we need to control what oil is left. We're on the half, we're at the halfway point, we want to have control of what's left. Uh, let me catch people who haven't asked. I think it was a question over here. Well, yes, um, I understand that some of the firefighters that went into uh, the World Trade Center uh, prior to the collapse, they um, were saying that um, they heard explosions coming from the basement. Right. That's right. That's just confirming evidence. I mean, the w w New York Times asked for, there was tape recordings made of firefighters, by t by, of firefighters making tape recordings of what they experienced. New York Times filed suit to get that publicly released, and finally it was publicly released by court order. And the, yes, you're right. Okay. Yes. Which revolution? The revolution. 1979? No. No. Uh, 30 years ago. When, um, huh? 30 years ago. Yeah, 1979. Oh, yeah. I thought you said that. Mohammed Mosaddegh for 1979. What? No, she means 79. Yeah. So what's the question? Um, do you think that was also done by CIA? It would be the other way around. I mean, Shaw was our friend. Yeah. Yeah, but I read somewhere um, that CIA has something to do with, because of the uh, raising, they were raising the cost of oil. Um, and Shaw was one of the people who agreed to that. I, had, I just didn't know that. Oh. I don't know. You had your hand. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all, all this just speculation. Any, any implication of all of these conspiracies is just torture. Now, certainly, I, considering my background and my, my political predilections, I mean, I could imagine all of this happening. But I mean, in terms of these, in, in terms of these books that have been written, I would throw those out immediately because it's not first-hand source. It's what some other guy said about this, and who knows where he got his material to begin with and all. So I think it's entirely possible. Do you think, implication, I think, do you think I lied about the Martin Luther King uh, conviction of government agency in his own assassination? No, I would, I would say, I would have to know, I would have to see no. some original data, the original things. Might okay, so do you... the word for someone else who's written another book? Well, okay, no, I, uh, just, uh, just, I mean, you pull up the court record. Okay, well, okay, that's, okay. that's what I would think. Okay. okay. But other types of things in terms of anything else these guys have written that I... Unless so I let me do myself, and it was a part of a public ref record, or it was incontrovertible evidence. Then I would have to be very careful. So then you would, but you wouldn't be careful about the government's 9/11 Commission report. I'll be careful about it all, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm just saying I would have to see original data, which may be impossible to find. Never see that. Though. So. Okay, but now a little. Okay, I mean, I personally know the woman who handed okay. the dust. Dust to the, I personally know the physicist who looked at it, okay? What am I, uh, what more can I do? I'm not a, I mean, you know, I, I, I. You can't, you can't put all kinds of credence to that because you don't know what the source of the dust was. So yeah, I might have been. I trust, it I, it's, it's like, I trust, I know this woman. I mean, actually she died of cancer. She thinks because of the dust of the World Trade Center. She died like three months ago, but forgetting about that. 
I personally know the woman, I trust her, that she would not give deceptive dust. I, what am I, I don't know what else to say, you know? I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, I know what else to say about other things, <laughs> but about that, okay? I mean, what I looked at, I mean, I didn't do this investigation, but I investigated what? The, finance, the insider trading before 9-11. I looked at real, I think it's real data coming out of the, um, there's a group uh, that publishes uh, put options. I looked at real data put options, okay? Real data put options, okay? I looked at real prices, okay? Now, I don't think they were fabricated in, in the Wall Street Journal, okay? And I l drew some conclusions. That, that doesn't lead any credence to the dust. You know, no, I right. <laughs> That's not about dust, right. <laughs> Do you think it's reasonable to simply say that the questions you raise are questions that would reasonably have been questions that should have been investigated by the commission? Yes. Yeah. I think that's a reasonable yeah. I mean, I... This cluster of issues, let, and they should have been investigated. Yeah. Okay, let me say this about that, because that's where... I. Actually, I used to introduce my talk in this kind of skepticism. Well, I just think that they should have done a better job. But, what I, I, but I've been doing it so long, and it comes, there's so much coming at me that I, I passed beyond that point personally. Okay? But I will, I will sell my own book for a moment. Okay? This book doesn't, doesn't lay the blame on somebody. It, it really is in, in the genre of asking you to ask questions. It's not in the genre of of uh, we can prove who did it or something like that, or that it was even, sh some of the writers here would say it's sure, okay? Others would say, well, 99% or something like that, that it was an inside job. You had a question. Uh, just to wonder in supporting of, just look at the Gulf of Tonkin, that was a total lie by the government, that factually you can look that up. They lied and misled the public on that, that the whole incident um, that lead us into the war. I mean, that's pretty much accepted nowadays as public record for that side of the example. Right. But uh, one more question on 11. When they talked about um, uh, why, did, why did they blame Saudi Arabia? I'm just wondering why you think, why not blame Iraq if Iraqi um, fundamentalists did this and if your goal is to get in Iraq, why blame an ally in Saudi Arabia? I'm curious of what you might feel on that. Yeah, I know it'll be who knows, but okay. <laughs> Because um, in Saudi Arabia, we can't retaliate because they are friends. So, and they, all they are saying is this, just these few fellows in Saudi Arabia are like that, not the government of Saudi Arabia. I guess that's the reason. I mean, you're aware that most of them were Saudis, yeah. right? You're aware of that, okay? You're, but just to let you know, by the way, this, this guy whose picture here is, was not Saudi. He was a Lebanese. And one of the minor things I did in life was listen to his uncle's Invest, his uncle thinking about could my nephew have done what he's accused of doing, namely piloting a plane over Pennsylvania and crashing it into the ground and with the intention of having gone to the White House or whatever, okay? Could my, think about your being in a family and somebody in the family is accused, is dead, presu presumably, I mean not alive, okay, you don't see, accused of doing that and what does the family do? The family guys is shocked. Okay, and you think about it over and over and over again. Could he have done that? Okay, so I listened to the interview of the uncle, okay, who happens to be a, a small level banker in in Lebanon. First of all, he was he is Muslim, but he was raised in a, he was raised he was went to school in Catholic schools. Okay, he's not a Muslim. He was never a fanatic Muslim in any case. Okay, but just listening to the uncle describe how they came to the conclusion what, not that he was not on the plane. He could have been on the plane, but that's as far as they will go, okay? That he may have been taking a vacation trip from the East Coast to the West Coast, happened to be a pilot, uh, have a pilot license. By the way, none of the pilots were capable enough of doing, of, of piloting any of those planes in the, in, in the manners in which they were done. I mean, that just, they just weren't that good, okay, as pilots. But anyway, he happened to have a pilot's license, so maybe, Whatever I don't know how he got on that particular plane. I mean, what I don't know, but you know, I don't know what else to say. I was just wondering why they would blame Iraqi people. You know, I mean, that's where you want to go. Why blame the Saudi? But I understand the history of Saudi Arabia yeah. and the fundamentalists, the, the Russian conflict in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't know the answer to why. why.
I mean, I, because I probably I don't even know who really was on the planes. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think the last part of your presentation is uh, well documented, uh, documented last year, inside job, which was done by a Harvard University professor on, on derivatives. And when I saw that documentary last year, there were about five people that he ate up. And it really proves the last part of that, that not only did Wall Street know what they were doing, but they created schemes that they knew were going to fail, and that the government paid them back. And the reason why they produced inside jobs is because no one has gone to jail. That's actually pretext of that documentary. And I would strongly suggest it won the Academy Awards last year. Are you talking about the movie Inside Job? Oh, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Okay, yeah, okay, right. Now, All right. I teach African American history. When we deal with lynching, my students are shocked by the crowds of people and the festive atmosphere that people express lynching blacks. And when Without Sanctuary exhibit came to New York City, people were shocked at how people behaved in lynching blacks. We read declassified FBI files, and my book, fortunately, has the phrase COINTELPRO. A lot of history books will not put that phrase in. And it shows that J. Edgar Hoover had an intense program to terminate the Black Panthers. And, and J. Edgar Hoover, on record, said, the most dangerous man in America is Martin Luther King. I mean, that, that's just quoted. So uh, I think all of that's actually fun. The way the FBI shot down Fred Hampton, and that anniversary was last year, I think people are not really, you know, Americans are in denial of the violence and the fact that people might be behind that. I think people just don't want to see it. Yep. By the way, I, 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 I want to say one more thing. I, that. One of the reasons why I did this whole thing about, I mean, because I didn't come to the conclusion that the that this was an intentional shock, the financial shock was a planned, conscious thing to destroy the American working class or labor movement. Or I mean, I didn't say that. Okay, I, I didn't say it didn't. I didn't say it did. I don't know. Okay, but what I, what I was trying to raise the issue is if we are more conscious of how, the violence that the government can do and, and and how they can do it in a shocking way, like 9/11. Then we start to becoming immunized, not to, we'll never be totally immunized, but we'll be more immunized against it when it happens again, okay? I mean, just, I, I don't want to be morbid, but I will be for a second. Uh, we have a gentleman, John, wherever you went, he, he, uh, he, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> I pick on Cleveland. Um, I mean, let's just suppose that tomorrow morning you hear that a nuclear bomb goes off, went off by terrorist in, in Cleveland and 30,000, 100,000 people are dead, and uh, 300,000 are subject to radioactive, you know, what, you know, in some sense, when you, when you think of the possibility of shock therapy as a way to control a population, then you're more ready to think even immediately about what's happening. That's really what I'm trying to do. Somebody else had a question, yeah. Is it, by the way, I just in case people don't know aware of where other people think, I we once had an economist from Cuba who came to visit the, my economics department, and uh, he said that in Havana they have proof that that the bomb was blown. I mean, it was an intentional thing. I mean, it's intentional uh, just blowing up of the main, which led to the Spanish-American War. Okay. The latest story, I understand, from the United States point of view, no longer says that it was uh, the Spanish who did it. I mean, the, yeah, the, Sp the Spanish who did it. They now say that it was an accident. And that's, I think that's the U.S. position now, that, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And so they've kind of backtracked. But you think about it, how many people, how, how about how the world changed as a result of that, quote, accident? Okay, we got Philippines. We got Guam, we got Puerto Rico, we got the Platt Amendment into the Cuban Constitution, which said that we can intervene whenever we wanted to. I mean, it was kind of useful from an imperialist point of view. Do you think Homeland Security legislation is worse than COINTELPRO? I don't know. Just, just in terms of COINTELPRO? I haven't heard that term before. COINTELPRO? Is that what it is? Pro. Pro is an FBI program.
I will. I, there are interesting comparisons between Homeland Security and COINTELPRO. That actually Homeland Security, as a body of laws, are actually worse than COINTELPRO. I just haven't looked at it. Well, if you look at the Patriot Act, sure, Patriot Act, and you look at the Nazi empowering legislation of 1933, you will see textual parallels in terms of the powers that the state has. Which is an interesting thing. And then on a labor front, there's a whole history of American labor struggle. For example, the Haymarket martyrs, the explosion that went off, it wasn't done by labor. They were hung. Hanged, I should say. Now let me, by calling tell, I mean, let me mention one thing uh, that I, I got myself into hot water actually within my own people who look at 9-11 okay by something I did today that, that that I wouldn't have done probably two weeks ago because things have happened to, to me I mean I'm still active in this stuff I said something about the Pentagon and the flight path of this plane in the Pentagon okay there are people there's a blogger called 9-11 blogger 9-11 blogger dot Com, which is the leading site for 9-11 issues, okay, for a, quite a while now, okay? They refuse to let anybody who promotes what I just wrote, which I gave you the link to about the Pentagon from publishing on that 9-11 blogger site. I mean, it's a, it's a blogger. I mean, you're supposed to be able to, okay. So, and I'm not 100% sure, but I'm beginning to think that the government has infiltrated the 9-11 blogger. They set up their own site. Well, this, I think this one actually was probably maybe taken over, not, not started okay. initially, but I think because there was changes in ownership and blah, 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 okay? Now, that comes back to Martin Luther King because uh, uh, William Pepper, who was the lawyer who prosecuted this trial that I mentioned here, okay, he gave a speech to the 9-11 people in Chicago like five years ago that I went to, okay? And... Um, and Pepper's comment was a warning to us, okay? He said that there are agents everywhere. And he said that he thought he was a sophisticated, he thought he himself was a sophisticated guy, but even so, one guy tricked him. And he found out later, he figured it out later, that, one, that he was tricked by somebody who really thought he was on his side and he wasn't. So. There's no sense worrying. Yeah, but yeah, yeah we, we have to we have to then think about what to do about it. I'm not trying to say I'm not trying to be I'm, I'm not I'm not trying. Well, you have to care to some extent, okay? Yeah. yeah I'm just curious to know about the black box. I mean, supposedly that's probably the most indestructible, indestructible part of an airplane. And I'm just curious to know if they discovered any black boxes. Good question. Okay. What was it? Black box. Out of the okay. world trade, two planes. Four boxes, supposedly, okay? They claim they didn't have them, okay? Well, somebody, huh? black boxes, just a second, okay? They claimed they didn't find him, okay? Somebody came forward, and I don't, I don't remember everything I come across, okay? But I could find it if I had to find it. Somebody said we, and it's two of them, found three of them, okay? And that's the last, they, they turned them over, and that's the last they've ever heard of them. Another thing is about there, and this is for sure, that there's a huge number of video cameras aiming at the Pentagon, including from just simple hotels. And that gas, that same gas station that I was referring to, the government got to those, all those video cameras and took them very quickly after, nine, after the event of the Pentagon being hit. How did they even know to do that? You know, how did they even get their act together to get it all, you know, there's a... Uh, Holiday Inn or something like that, a hotel, 10 floors up, and, 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 and they got them everywhere. They got them all, okay? To this day, the government has the, the evidence of what hit the Pentagon. Why don't they show the damn pictures, the videos? Why don't they show just the simple damn videos? And it'll settle at least that discussion, okay? Uh, but I, I, I know... I, I know some people who actually think that, that the plane really did hit the Pentagon and the government really has the videos and they are waiting to suck us in to saying it didn't hit the video and then they will show the video that it did hit and then it will destroy the whole 9-11 movement. I mean, you know, so, you know, there's a lot of things to, um, to uh, you know, to get absorbed with if you want to get absorbed with it. <laughs>
But I, I, I tell you, I mean, on Kennedy's assassination, I started looking at that, for, and this is about 10 years ago, I started looking at the assassination for a while. And uh, the Zabuda film, you know, everybody, you know, Zabuda film, the source, okay? And fine, one day I come across a, a reproduction of the Zabuda film, which, which they show if you do very fine magnifying glass on it, you find out there's all kinds of X's on, on, on the film, okay? And then I, re I and then I realized, you know, well they can even they can even take the Zabruder film, and f and 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 um, re um, edit it, okay, and then <laughs> and then have you le led you to leave the X's, and then you give up, okay, <laughs> you know. So uh, you know, uh, all kinds of things are possible. <laughs>